basically what um, I'm going to present today is a paper on fine wine in China and Hong Kong. So it's a paper that um, I wrote with uh, Philippe Marseille, who is also here, and uh, our two co-authors from Bordeaux, Benoit and Eric. Um, so maybe to introduce this a little bit, so um, the idea that we had was to say, okay, what's a fine wine? In the end, was, if you analyze fine wine from an investment perspective, well, it's kind of pretty much um, categorized. So what you see is that 90% of fine wines is more or less Bordeaux. So you have some Burgundy wines, some very good Italian wines, but if you want to invest in wine, it, it still remains uh, Bordeaux largely. Um, so how do we define this? It's basically a wine that you can resell on a secondary market. So it's a wine that you can purchase, you can buy, sell at auctions, uh, wine merchants, etc. cetera. Um, and we also tried to come up with some kind of key features to define this. And the ones that we found was basically that this market is kind of segmented. So you, it's, kind of, it's kind of difficult to uh, transport your wines around. So if you purchase it in Paris, it's kind of difficult to sell it in Los Angeles or in Tokyo or in Hong Kong. So it's kind of a bit segmented. I'm not saying you can't do it, but it's not that easy. Um, also, it's a kind of illiquid market. So if you want to get rid of 100 bottles of Lafitte, it's not going to be that easy um, either. So you have to wait a little bit. Otherwise, the market price is going to crash. Um, and then basically what this leads to is kind of in finance, we'd say inefficient markets. So you have high transaction costs. It's very illiquid. It's kind of you have kind of price divergences between different uh, countries or places because um, the transactions kind of are, are segmented. But it was the first step. So um, over the last 15 years, we also have a wine market that has kind of evolved quite a lot. So as probably most of you know, for different reasons. So one of them is that more and more people are actually investing in wine as an asset. So it's not to consume, it's not to, to drink, it's really to to buy and sell and make a profit on it. Um, another second uh, large um, characteristic that we saw emerging in the last 15 years, and that's why we are talking about this here, is basically uh, how China behaved. So since 2005, China is in the World Trade Organization. Um, custom duties has uh, decreased quite a lot. In Hong Kong, the uh, excise duties have been banished in 2008 on wine. So it's kind of getting easier and easier for China and Hong Kong to import wines, to um, sell wines, at, at relatively cheaper prices than, than beforehand. Um, so what has this led to? Basically, it has led to two things. So China nowadays is the biggest importer of Bordeaux wines, and Hong Kong is basically the number one auction place for wines in general and for Bordeaux wines as well. So um, it used to be London. Nowadays, Hong Kong is way larger than any other auction place that we have in the world. Um, so what we are going to analyze is basically how this um, Chinese demand and this um, ascent of Hong Kong as a trading place um, has, uh, what, 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 what's the impact of this on wine prices from Bordeaux? Um, so linked to this, we have three hypotheses. The first one, um, quite an easy one, is basically to say, well, wines that were sold at Hong Kong auctions kind of trigger a premium. To say, well, um, there's a huge demand there. Um, as you probably all know, um, Chinese are very kind of in favor of Lafitte for, uh, and Mouton Rothschild, etc. So um, due to this high demand, basically the prices should be higher there than in London or Paris or New York or whatever else, uh, when, wherever else you could sell um, these wines. So that's our first hypothesis. The second one that we have is also linked to the premium to say, okay, is the premium constant or not? Um, and what we um, hypothesize is actually um, those wines that are the most visible, that have the highest reputation, probably are going to trigger the highest premium because it's kind of a, a new product if you want and we are kind of convinced that most Chinese kind of look at the label right now and, and buy what they know. Um, and, and this is unfortunately not a lot right now. It's evolving but um, it's basically the same brands that they are buying all along. So what we believe is that if you have wines with a very good uh, expert score, they are going to trigger a high premium. If you have wines with a very strong brand, um, so typically marketing of Lafitte, etc., was very good. They are also going to trigger a higher premium. And our last hypothesis is basically to say, okay, since the opening of the market in 2008 in Hong Kong, um, the premium has kind of declined for different reasons, probably the major one being that people kind of started to learn a little bit more about wine. So that's what we heard yesterday in the presentation. Um, most Chinese started with Bordeaux, started with very good Bordeaux, and now they are slowly um, discovering Burgundy, they are discovering Italy, so they are kind of, of diversifying a little bit their investments and their drinking habits. Okay, so that's uh, the three hypothesis that we want to test. Um, so the data that we have um, is 
quite um, quite a lot of data actually. Um, so what we did here in the first step is basically collect uh, all auction prices on uh, the 14 most famous Bordeaux wines. So we have vintages from 1945 to 2010. Um, we have a period covering 2007 to 2014. Um, so we started in 2007 because the first wine auctions in Hong Kong basically happened in 2008, so we can't go before that because we don't have anything happening there. Um, and then we have data from the five major global auction houses. So we have them from Acker Merrill, uh, Christie's, Sotheby, Sackey's and Bonhams. So they are all kind of present in Hong Kong, most of them in London and uh, most of them also in New York. So there's the three major places. And in total we have more or less 100,000 lots um, that are worth more or less 700 million US dollars. Um, also have information on the Parker scores for every wine and vintage. We have um, information on the number of lots um, that were sold, uh, sorry, for the number of bottles in the lots because this has uh, some kind of impact on the prices you can fetch. And we also have information if the wine is sold in the original wooden case or not. So there's also been some kind of evidence in literature that this triggers a premium. So we're controlling for all these kind of things. Okay, so what are we doing methodology-wise? Um, in the end, nothing very new, so a kind of simple hedonic um, um, regression uh, with different characteristics. Um, so once we have run this, we basically look at four different specifications. So the four specific, uh, sorry, four was this morning. The five specifications that we have here is actually um, dependent on auction places, auction houses, and wine characteristics. So in every specification, we account for the producer, for the chateau, for the vintage, for the rating, for the wooden case, and for the number of bottles in, in the lot. And then depending on the specification, we change things a little bit. So um, auction house um, location is also always uh, in it. Auction house name is in it as a dummy and the time of sale to get a, a kind of index. And where we then kind of uh, look at different things is on this part here. So basically, um, what we are looking at here is um, a kind of um, uh, interaction term, sorry, um, between the Hong Kong Premium and Parker, Hong Kong Premium and the Chateau for a kind of brand um, idea, and then um, the brand power um, and the Hong Kong Premium as well. So the idea is really to look at different things that might explain the premium if it declines what's really driving this kind of premium. So that's the idea of our specifications. Um, so if I take the first hypothesis, actually what you see, so that's basically the, um, the hedonic regression that we ran. You always have the coefficients and the p-values. Um, and actually what you see is that um, you have some wines where um, it kind of triggers a premium in Hong Kong and for some it doesn't. So uh, for those where it doesn't really trigger a premium, it's especially uh, ICAM. So what you see is that ICAM is sold at a way higher price than in Hong Kong, not very surprising. Um, Chinese um, kind of tend not to like sweet wines. It's not in their taste habits. Um, they by far uh, prefer red wines, so that's also something that we knew beforehand. Um, so what you see is actually where this is kind of, of driving prices, especially for Lafitte. So Lafitte has a higher coefficient in Hong Kong and also for Oson, uh, which is also having a, a higher coefficient. Um, and the other thing that is kind of interesting here is basically what I put here in red. Um, so what you see is that the Hong Kong dummy is 0.18, which kind of means that we have an 18% premium uh, if a wine is sold in Hong Kong, compared to the other auction places in the world, so mainly uh, London, Geneva, Paris, Amsterdam, New York, some in Los Angeles, that's what we have. Um, so it seems that hypothesis one is kind of confirmed, we have a, a premium if you sell your wine in Hong Kong. Um, <laughs> okay, um, if I look a little bit more uh, into the details, so what you see is that this premium is not really uniform. Um, so here the, the base vintage that we took is 1945, so that's the one that is selling for the highest price. And then what we see is that depending on the vintage, again kind of a classic outcome, um, it kind of drives the price. So what you see is 1947-49 uh, is actually selling for 30% 30, uh, 30 less than 1945. Um, 1959, 61 is selling for a, quite a high price, 82, um, we have 2000, 2005, and here at the end, you can't really see, but 2009, 10 as well. So we really have, like in, in other studies, these very good vintages that basically sell for higher prices than others. Um, for the auction location and uh, wine prices, so what we see in black is basically Hong Kong that is kind of rescaled here, and in red you have um, the world without Hong Kong, 
And what you see here is that um, Hong Kong seems kind of more volatile. So what you see, you have way more spikes. You have a huge one here in 2010. Then you have some here, here, and here. So it, it seems as if there it's more a, well, it's not as flat. People are kind of more, it's a, maybe a cowboy mentality. I buy, I don't buy, I don't know. It, it seems a bit different from, from uh, the way people in, in the rest of the world are buying this. Okay, going to hypothesis two. So here we look at this um, from different uh, ways on. So hypothesis two is really looking, okay, what is driving the premium? For which wines is the premium the highest? And actually here what you see is that the premium is very high for wines that have a perfect Parker score of 100. So we have a kind of huge coefficient of 0.2. So if you have a perfect Parker score, in Hong Kong, wines sell for 20% higher prices on average than elsewhere in the world. And uh, kind of surprisingly, what we see as well is that it's kind of a U-shaped thing. So the coefficients are very high for wines with very low Parker ratings and for the 100, but then here you kind of have a, a valley where it's a bit lower. So there's still a premium, but it's not as high. So what we, uh, the way we interpret this is basically, well, if you have 100 out of 100, it's a perfect score. It's kind of showing that you have perfect wine in your cellar and you can show this to, to, your, uh, um, to your customers, to your friends, to your colleagues, I don't know. Um, and then for the, for the lower ratings, the way we interpret this um, is basically that maybe there is something with the brand behind it. So it might be that you have, I don't know, a Lafitte or a Mouton Rothschild from a very weak uh, vintage that doesn't have a very good um, score and they still go for the brand. So basically what we argue is that some customers maybe don't have enough information, they don't know enough about wine, so they say, it's Lafitte, I don't care if it's a 82 or 2005 or if it's a really crappy vintage. I just buy because of the brand. So this might explain this. It's one explanation that we have. Um, so if I turn to a second spe specification, um, basically we took the 14 uh, producers and what you see is that basically the best known ones um, in Asia drive the highest uh, premium. So you have Lafitte that has 26% uh, premium on average, um, Mouton 22% uh, on average, and Petrus which is also kind of well known, and Le Pain, 20% <laughs> uh, premium. So it seems that really the brands that that kind of are very good in marketing and anyone who has been in China can see that Lafitte actually are very good. They have enormous amounts of different wines there. Um, actually drive the prices. So that's a second thing that kind of goes in the direction people are, are buying brands and are buying stuff that they know. And this is basically driving the price upwards because they always buy the same wine. And the third thing we look at um, is about brand power. So here what we used is um, basically the ranking that uh, Livex is publishing. So they have a ranking where they kind of look at the brand power of different wines, uh, ranking from one to 50. So uh, as far as I know, Lafitte is again number one. And what you see here is that actually um, you have a negative coefficient, which means the, well, if you are number one, you're basically the best. So if you're the best, the price um, is higher and the premium is higher in Hong Kong. So basically what we get out of this is that out of these three specifications, well, the more visible your brand is, the better, in a sense, you are able to communicate on your brand, and the better the, the ranking and the better the rate is on your brand, the higher the premium. So that's basically the outcome of these three specifications. And finally, the last one is on the declining Hong Kong premium. Um, and actually what we see um, is that through time, so between 2008 and 2014, um, the premium has not disappeared, but it has um, gone down quite a lot. So what you see, um, so the black one is basically a kind of trend line. Um, in 2008, we kind of started with a premium that was averaging 60 to 70 percent, which is really huge. Um, and through time, what we see is that we still have a premium here, more or less, of around 15 percent. Um, it's still way lower. And then what we also have, again, it's kind of, of spiking around, so especially this one here. So it's, it's not a mistake. Um, it's actually in 2010, there were, there were some auctions in, in Hong Kong where uh, wines really went for very, very, very crazy prices. Um, so we thought we are not going to skip this because this is reality. That's what happened back there. Um, and, and basically what you see is that from here onwards, it's kind of going down. Uh, and the explanation that we have um, for this is that people kind of learn more and more about wine. So if you go to Hong Kong and Shanghai, what you see is that people get more and more interested in different wines. Um, so basically, 
they kind of again drift away from all these very famous brands like Lafitte and Mouton to other kind of uh, wines, um, which basically drives the premium down because people are not only buying two or three brands, but 20, 30, 40 different brands. So that's the explanation that we have here. Um, so basically to summarize, what we find is that wines that are sold in Hong Kong trigger a premium of more or less 18-19% uh, over our period. Um, we think it's just the emergence of a strong demand from uh, China. So what you see is that actually most wines that are sold in Hong Kong are re-exported to China. Um, and this is basically what drove this. The um, thing is that you can't really do arbitrage, so it's difficult if you are located in China to go and buy your wine in, in New York or London. So I'm not saying this is never happening, but it's kind of not that easy. Um, so we really believe it's, it's Chinese customers that drove this uh, premium in Hong Kong. Um, then what we also saw is that the price premium is not uniform across all wines. So basically, if you have a stronger brand, if you have better ratings, better scores, premium is higher. And finally, what we also find is that the premium kind of declines through time. So with time, it kind of dis didn't disappear, but went down to more or less 10-15%. Um, so that's basically what I had to say. I tried to do it in 15 minutes. 